Lynn, it's so exciting to have you here at the Academy and working um, on our Mastery Hour virtually, albeit for now, but maybe in December. So I'm excited about that. Um, I was letting you know that every single week we run through the Academy process, your name gets mentioned, and every person on this, on this call, on this Zoom call, has thought about their relationship to money and their mindsets around money. Um, you're quite the uh, quite the professional in this, right? You've uh, you've written five books in this area. Am I right? Is that no, just one. Are you kidding? I wish I'd written five, but I'm re re working on another one. So, I've contributed to people's books, but I've only written written one of my very own. Okay, so that's the soul of money. But then, what that's was the unleashing of the soul of money? Is that another book or a program? That's a, a course that's uh, on the um, on a platform. Sounds true. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. So you've written one fabulous book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a variety of other courses and such. It's been reprinted a lot of times. It can count that. <laughs> and, and that book is based not really on your experience as a sort of a financial advisor, but on your 40 year experience as um, what you call a pro activist. Um, so why don't we start there? How on earth do you arrive at writing a book about money as someone who's spent their entire lives trying to save the world? Well, uh, I think probably everybody knows that if you're involved with big issues um, on this planet, you end up being a fundraiser. Um, you end up needing to garner the financial resources to make your dreams come true, to empower your team to make things happen. And um, I was fortunate enough to, um, in the early days of the, something called the Hunger Project, be a student of Buckminster Fuller's and um, Werner Erhard's, then I brought those two geniuses together and the Hunger Project was one of the uh, beautiful things that happened out of their relationship. And I didn't know anything about fundraising. Uh, I didn't know anything about hunger. I didn't know anything about making anything happen. But the Hunger Project really um, uh, took my breath away. This commitment to end world hunger became uh, uh, my passion, my commitment. It sort of, uh, I turned my life over to it. I had three little kids, so it wasn't convenient. Uh, but something about the capacity to make a difference with my life, which I learned from Buckminster Fuller, um, was so compelling that I became deeply involved, you might say, uh, obsessed, uh, some people probably would have said, but I'd say profoundly committed to this uh, issue of ending world hunger. And um, uh, in order to get involved in something like that, somebody needs need to raise some money. And it ended up becoming my job to do that. So um, from the very start of the Hunger Project, we invented uh, a fundraising methodology that was consistent with the end of hunger rather than its persistence which meant we really needed to look deeply into people's relationship with money. The whole mindset of scarcity, the mindset of accumulation and acquisition, the mindset of competition. And it began to be clear to, uh, to me that uh, the way we deal with money had a lot to do with why there were a billion people hungry all the time, most of them children under five, that the money system, our relationship with money uh, was one of the drivers uh, of that was creating the world that none of us really wanted. So um, that became a, a, not the only thing I did. Obviously, I was working to end world hunger. I was in all the places you would imagine, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Ghana, Senegal, all those places, uh, learning from people I used to call poor. Um, and once I met them and knew them and worked side by side with them, I. Uh, I, um, I found out that there's nothing poor about them, um, that they have a kind of strength and resilience, a kind of clarity about what life's really about, that those of us who have a lot of financial resources at, at our disposal maybe kind of forget, um, and that, um, that they uh, had enormous wisdom to teach us. So I, I, I now never call people poor or rich. I, I just know they're human beings living in the ebb and flow of, of different financial circumstances. Uh, but those people, particularly uh, people in really desperate situations, war and poverty, 
uh, taught me a lot about money. I mean, it's kind of odd to say that, but I didn't learn, I didn't go to business school. I didn't learn about finance. I learned about our distorted, uh, really um, uh, pathological relationship with money uh, from people who have enormous amounts of money and from people who have very little. Um, and that taught me a great deal about money. So then uh, not only did I learn about ending world hunger, I learned about ending the hunger within us, uh, the, the kind of deficit way we relate to ourselves often. That's the source of so much pain and suffering in the world. And, um, and a lot of that has to do with our dysfunctional relationship with money. So that was a long answer, but am I right. going where you want me to go? <laughs> scarcity um, and, and you have a sort of a framework around scarcity that's fascinating it's not just about money right it's, it's money. right right can you dive into that scarcity mindset and how you feel it sort of impacted us at a, at a social level well um, I think that particularly people in the affluent world and it's really everywhere now but that our um, economic system our commercial culture our consumer culture has um, promoted for so long, it was here before we were born, it'll probably be here, well, I hope it's not here when we die, but um, a culture of thinking that's actually, there's not enough to go around. A culture of thinking that's actually a mindset. And it's not after thoughtful consideration or measurement or looking, it's, it's a, almost a lens through which we look in the commercial consumerized culture that sort of a desperate experience or belief without uh, like a, what I want to call an unconscious, unexamined belief. Um, unconscious, unexamined belief is one you don't even know you have. Um, that there's not enough to go around and someone somewhere is always going to be left out. Kind of this desperate, there's not enough time, there's not enough money, there's not enough love, there's not enough sex, there's not enough this, there's not enough that. There's not enough market share. There's not enough square feet in my house. There's not enough this, there's not enough that. It's sort of a siren song of there's not enough and I've got to have more. And this I'm talking about as a um, unconscious, unexamined mindset that sort of overlays life in uh, the intensity of the consumer culture. So when we look out from where we are and we look out at the world, what we perceive is that there's not enough. Um, and that perception is really in the Yes. Okay, muted. <laughs> Hi, Deborah. <laughs> You're muted. Okay, I'm sorry about that, Lynn. Please go on. No, I know. I I've been on a zillion Zoom calls. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this, this uh, mindset of scarcity is actually important to uh, the economic system where we're all caught in, um, uh, but it dribbles over into everything. So there's not enough love, there's not enough sex, there's not enough hours in the day, there's not enough weekends. Now there's, and even for people who have more than they need, then they don't have enough time. So everything often gets translated into this there's not enough mentality, which has us really uh, believing that we have to have more. Uh, and then, so the first sort of what I call the three toxic myths of the mindset, the unconscious, unexamined mindset of scarcity are, there's not enough, more is better, is the second toxic myth. And then the third toxic myth is that's just the way that it is. Um, and there's not enough is self-explanatory, more is better is self-explanatory, but I'll just say the more is better mentality haunts us way, way, way more than we know, I think. The tyranny of the consumer culture, the intensity of the messaging that tells us we're not okay unless we acquire something, um, whatever it is people are uh, providing or selling. Uh, and the um, uh, and then this, what holds it all in place is this sort of unconscious belief that that's just the way that it is and you have to buy in. Um, and in the more is better toxic myth number two, I like to point out that, um, you know, this is also different now because of the pandemic, but I'll just say before the pandemic, one of the fastest growing industries 
in the United States and actually starting to be in all the um, affluent countries of the world is uh, something called storage. Mm -hmm. And when you think about storage and waste, two industries growing like crazy. I mean, outstripping the automobile industry, outstripping so many industries. It's, um, it's a kind of a poster child for a culture that's lost its way, that we would have the need for storage. Uh, you know, in the United States, and particularly in San Francisco where I live, there are so many homeless people. It's just, it's tragic. And yet we're not building houses for them. We're building houses for the stuff that we don't have uh, room for in our own houses. These little villages of, of storage units outside of San Francisco and Emeryville and in Richmond. And, and um, you know, we're building houses for our stuff before we're building houses for people. Um, and it's, a, it's an example of a culture that's lost its way. Lost its way and our, our waste uh, in, uh, is just a huge, huge problem, as we all know. And that industry just is growing like crazy. So um, that's an example of the more is better culture being out of control. And then this, that's just the way that it is, is what we use to just give up, to be resigned, to just go with it, to, to buy more stuff than we need, to just have the consumer culture be, you know, kind of flooding our consciousness all the time. So I, I have to say that during the pandemic, one of the things that I'm so grateful for is all of that is a little bit relaxed and a little bit less loud uh, and uh, not so haunting. And I think it's such a relief. And I've noticed that when you do, if you do watch television, when you see the pharmaceutical ads on television that are so, um, haven't yet uh, readjusted and they're so intense, you start to see how crazy advertising is, how, uh, you know, pathological the whole thing is, making you want uh, things that you don't need. So I feel grateful that there's a little bit of a let up right now from the intensity of the consumer culture that is telling you there's not enough to go around and you've got to get yours fast and accumulate as much as you possibly can or somebody else will get it, that more of everything is what you need and that that's it's just the way to live. That, that, that third toxicity, um, that's just the way it is, it is also one that is so insidious, right? Because it, it's hard to even realize that that's what you believe. Or, or mm -hmm. what you, you just, that's how you receive the world. You kind of pivot in a lot of your, your, your writing and your discussions around this idea, though, that there seem to be two movements. One is moving from um, being a consumer to being a citizen and the other one is from shifting your focus from belongings to belonging. Could you, could you talk to us about those shifts, those personal shifts that we can make that kind of move us from kind of being in those three toxicities and maybe moving to something that is more connected? Well, that's so great that you're saying that. I forgot that because it's so, that's one of the possible gifts out of this period we're in right now. Um, you know, we used to use the word citizen. It was a very, very robust word when I was growing up. And the word citizen means he or she who stands responsible for, who takes responsibility or holds themselves responsible for the well-being of the community, the well-being of the state, the well-being of the country, the well-being of the world. Um, so the citizen is a very noble term for a human being. And one, you sort of you know, sit up straight when you think of yourself as a citizen, he or she who's responsible for the well-being of the country or the state or the world. The word consumer means he or she who takes, diminishes, depletes, or destroys. And we have devolved from being citizens to consumers, and we even label ourselves consumers. We call ourselves consumers. We're measured by our consumer habits. We're marketed to by our consumer habits. There's algorithm, in, algorithm al, whatever that word is, algorithms invented to be able to, you know, just, you know, pierce into our consumer habits. So we've become a, almost um, devolved to uh, being actually not just con 
uh, being called that, but being that. And that is an ugly label for a human being. He or she who takes, diminishes, uh, destroys, um, or, um, or disables. And so I'm uh, so um, grateful that the pandemic is relaxing that muscle, that habit, that addiction. I actually think it's become an addiction to be a consumer. I think we've been lulled or seduced uh, very cleverly and, and people in marketing and advertising are doing a fantastic job because everybody thinks they need everything that they don't need. Um, and I think this being um, not able to shop, not able to consume the way we used to be able to, it's almost like, you know, going to a, um, uh, you know, one of these programs that people who are uh, who have addictions go to. They have to stay there long enough that the addiction starts to wane and doesn't have so much power over them. And the pandemic may have that uh, that gift to us, maybe that blessing, because we have started to define ourselves, as you said, by our belongings. Do we have a house on the beach? Do we have a plane? Um, do we have um, a lot of square feet in our house? Do we have all these things? We've started to define ourselves and define other people by that, rather than seeing who they really are, which is that sense of belonging rather than belongings. What we really crave, and it's so clear now, and thank God for Zoom, Thank God for you, Jeff. Thank God for Chip. Thank God for your whole team, because I'm sure everybody's on this um, wonderful Zoom session because they belong to this community and they love the belonging experience from being through the program. That sense of belonging is what gives people their sense of prosperity, their sense of value, their sense of worth, not, not consuming something else, but actually feeling that belonging to this community, feeling that relationship, feeling that belonging as, um, as the, a, a, a citizen of the planet, as a citizen of the earth, a citizen of these times we're living in. So um, that's where I think we want to return to, you could say, rather than go. Uh, it's like a reclaiming, uh, renewal. I think this is a time of reset, regenerate, reimagine, renew, rejuvenate, respect, which means to re-see, respectate, um, restore, um, you know, this is another reformation, a reformulation of life. And I, um, you're not asking me this, but I do want to say that I'm, I'm very engaged with a very close friend of mine named Zach Bush. And I had an interview with him yesterday. I interviewed him yesterday. I don't know if you know him, but he's the most amazing guy. You should definitely bring him to the Modern Elders Academy. Um, and he's a physician and he has um, he says that the virus and all viruses in all animals and all plants are a genetic update, a very important genetic biological update. Um, and that we as a species, the human species, has become so predatory, so um, consumptive that, um, that the virus is a like a cleanse like a genetic update to a species that's headed towards its own extinction. This is a pretty controversial way to talk about the virus, but he's talking about it very boldly. Um, and that all animals, all evolution in his way of seeing the world, and I'm very um, grateful to even have this lens, you know, it's, it's another way to see, um, is uh, a, uh, like a course correction, a genetic course correction for more powerful and accurate adaptation to what's going on uh, with the biology of the earth and with the evolutionary plan for life. And I, I love that. I, I can't prove it, I'm not a scientist, but just knowing that that might be possible um, gives me a sense that belonging to this earth now, really feeling that we belong here, and given that we do belong here, to be in reverence with the resources that are here and not take more than we need could be the greatest thing that comes out of this, uh, this disruption, this pandemic, this pause, this reset. Mm -hmm. um, you sometimes talk about the dream of the modern world. I believe it's part of your work with Pachamama and this idea that maybe we've been in a dream and that the 
the virus as a moment of, of wake up. Um, how would you counsel us? And how have you seen people wake up from that dream? What are the practices? What are the things that, that we might need to do to change? Whether it's our relationship to money or our relationship to those three toxicities, how, how do people wake up to that? Well, they go to the Modern Elder Academy. That's how they do it. <laughs> uh, that's very important. That's number one. Uh, but not everybody's going to do that, unfortunately. Um, but certainly, uh, uh, I mean, this gives me an opportunity to say the Pachamama Alliance, which I co-founded with my husband, Bill and John Perkins, is a place where you can go to actually take the Awakening the Dreamer Symposium online, which is, you know, if I do say so myself, an amazing two-hour program that will blow your mind and wake you up like no kidding. And then uh, take online the Game Changer Intensive, which is part of Pachamama Alliance, which looks at the structures and systems that we're trapped in that need to be released and transformed for us to move into a new dream, a new way of seeing life. And then the third program we have by one of the colleagues who've been, who's been at the Modern Elder Academy, and I'm sure have done one of these talks, is Paul Hawkins' Drawdown. So we we deliver these programs in 88 countries and 16 languages. It's all online and you can really wake up if you take these programs. But also I'd say to, um, to use this time of this pause, this reflection, this being at home. I mean, you know, it's almost like someone told us to go to our room and wake up until we behave, you know. We've all been told to go to our room, to go home, to, um, and it's such, it's such an incredible thing to be mandated to do what we've all wanted. Um, you know, we, I don't know how many times I've said, God, I wish I spent more time at home. I, I, I bet, you know, 90% of the people on this call have said that from time to time. And um, one of our great shamans that I um, revere and hold in my heart at all times. I'm going to just get a quote. Um, Arkan Lushwala has said about this pandemic, uh, and it's a little bit different than your question, but I'm going to read it anyway. He says, in a deep primordial part of ourselves, many of us have been waiting for something like this to happen. Someone or something powerful and sacred enough had to intervene in order to stop the destruction of the sources of life to wake us up. The earth herself has now done so. Viruses, like everything, are made by the earth. And now as humanity, we are forced to make the sacrifices we could not make from our own will. Painfully now, the sacrifice goes beyond letting go of our comfort and the habits that led to an excessive consumption of goods, not only our needs, but to cons consume in excess for mere pleasure, comfort, and entertainment at the expense of the natural world and future generations. With deep compassion for those who are suffering, this beautiful shaman says, I have to say that the earth is still being kind and gentle, that her way of defending herself could be much worse, that this is not a punishment. She's an ally. This is a cleanse. This is an opening. This is an announcement. This is a gift. If I was to go through those, those three um, programs, um, whether it's the Pachamama Alliance, the Awakening the Dreamer, or the Game Changer Intensive, what are the mindsets that I'm looking to shift from? So if I'm going from not enough, more is better, and that's just the way it is, what, what, is there an end point that, that I'm try, trying to sort of move myself towards in terms of my shift in mindset? Um, well, yes. Uh, um, you know, the the kind of punchline of the soul of money message, which is very consistent with uh, the, the mission of the Pachamama Alliance is to bring forth an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just human presence on this planet. Mm. To bring forth an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just human presence on the planet. And consistent with that, with the soul of money, what we, um, we're really inviting people to do is when you clear away the mindset of scarcity, the there's not enough, more is better, that's just the way that it is, kind of 
mania, um, what you discover is you're enough, just exactly the way you are, just exactly the way you are, that your needs are met over and over and over again. Even people who are really now in trouble as a result of the pandemic, um, you know, I, I, I wanna say this with all my heart to those who are suffering, who've lost their jobs, who've lost their businesses, who've lost their homes. Look and see, however, that your needs keep being met they keep being met, the real needs that we have. And all of us to really see that enough is something that we can't even find in a consumer culture. We race right past enough and we don't even know that it happened towards more. But enough is this exquisite distinction of profound blessing, uh, the gift of life, the, um, you know, sufficiency, I have this principle, if you let go of trying to get more of what you don't really need, it frees up oceans of energy that's all tied up in the chase to turn and pay attention to what you already have. When you pay attention to what you already have, when you nourish what you already have, when you share what you already have, it expands, it expands. In other words, what you appreciate appreciates what you appreciate appreciates right now we are in such profound appreciation of teachers now if you're homeschooling your kids you are really appreciating what it takes to be a teacher <laughs> um, if uh, we are really appreciating our frontline workers we now call people we that used to fight for minimum wage we're not calling them low income, we're calling them essential workers, essential. I hope to God we keep that name for those people. The people who pick up our garbage, the people who make sure we have food and drive from the farm in a refrigerated truck to the grocery store. These people who fought to, to just get a minimum wage to have a living wage are now the essential people on our planet. And that is such a gift because that is, they're the people who make sure we have enough make sure we live in sufficiency, not in extravagance, but in sufficiency. You know, Gandhi said there's enough for our needs, but not for our greed. And so to really find that spot, and it's not even an amount of anything. I'm talking about a, a place, a, a place to dwell where your life is given to you, not something you're inside of. It's something you've been given and something that you can give. Um, those of us who are super blessed, which I imagine are the people on this call, also are, um, you know, if you're blessed, then your job is to bless. That's what to do with that blessing, is to bless other people. So um, what we appreciate appreciates. If you let go of trying to what you don't, let go of trying to get what you don't really need, it frees up all that energy that's tied up in the chase to pay attention to what you have. When you pay attention to what you have, when you nourish it, when you make a difference with it, and when you share it, that's when it expands. It expands from enough, not from lack. It expands, for, expands from sufficiency, not from scarcity. And that's a life worth living, and that's a life that has a planet that's healthy and well. Talk to us then. So I, I kind of started off kind of joking that you were a pro-activist. Um, but that is a serious idea, right? Um, and, th and there's something pretty profound there. And it ties to a lot of your thinking about service. Can you, can you talk to us about proactivism and service, even with our money and, and how we use money to be proactive? Well, I call myself a proactivist instead of an activist because I'm a particular kind of activist. I'm an activist for, not against. Um, and that's why I call it, uh, I'm a proactivist. And um, and I love activism and I love activists. So this is not uh, to say anything about anybody else, but for me, where I'm effective is when I'm an activist for, and that doesn't mean that I'm naive. I worked on hunger and poverty. I saw starvation. I've seen, I've been in war. I've seen, I've held dying babies in my arms that have starved to death in, in refugee camps. I, I worked with Mother Teresa. So I know pain and suffering. I'm not afraid of it. I've seen it, I've been there. But when I say I'm an activist for, not against, 
I know what's in between me and my vision for the world, what I'm for, um, and I'm not against it. I'm willing to hospice the death of the structures and systems that no longer serve us while we midwife the birth of those that do. Um, we, rather than attack, to allow th that which is unsustainable to die its natural death. And if you hospice it, it will die faster and more elegantly and with some nobility and dignity. So, um, you know, the capitalist system has served us beautifully and very, very well. And it's starting to be questioned. It's starting to be not so, we're not so sure about it now. Things like that, the economic system we're caught in, our, our, the failure of our democracy, you know, rather than attacking, allowing things that are no longer useful to, to, to go the way of, um, the way that they're going. Um, so I, I, I just, this thing about hospicing and midwifing, I guess is what I really want to say. That's what a proactivist does with a firm commitment and a fierce commitment to the world I want, an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just human presence on this planet. And, um, and I'm, I'm very aware of what's in the way of that, um, but I'm just not good at attacking. So that's not my way. So that's why I call myself a proactivist. And I love the people who have the guts to attack stuff. So nothing wrong with that. It's just not how I do it. There's a, there's a deep femininity in a lot of your metaphor, this sort of midwifing and, and, and so on. Um, you're also a, a sort of a broadly recognized leader, a, a, a sort of a, I don't know, I don't want to use the wrong language, but, but a feminine leader, a woman, a, a leadership model, a female leadership model um, that you present, you associate with all kinds of, of women leaders all around the world. Um, you, you mentioned Mother Teresa. I, I know your buddies with Oprah and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Um, what's the role of that kind of feminine leadership in this in this movement at this time? Um, well, uh, I I call this the uh, Sophia century. Um, the century when women will take our rightful role in co-equal partnership with men and the world will come into balance in this hundred year cycle. You know, the 20th century was dominated by war and the fear of war for 100 years. It was super violent. Um, um, the 21st century has a little bit of a rocky start here. Uh, and we're also in the first 20 years of the third millennium, if you think of it that way. Uh, but I call this the Sophia century, the first hundred years in the third millennium, if you look at the long view. <laughs> and the indigenous people that we work with have beautiful prophecies about the 21st century. And one of them I'd love to share with you, um, which is from the Cherokee people. And it says that, I'll back up a little bit here because I've got to demonstrate this. The Cherokee people say that the bird of humanity has two wings, uh, a male wing and a female wing and that the bird of humanity in the 21st century, uh, things will change because the bird of humanity has been flying primarily for hundreds of years with the male wing fully extended, fully expressed, with the female wing in all of us somewhat unexpressed, somewhat truncated and not yet fully uh, extended, while the male wing has become overextended, over muscular, and had to become violent uh, to keep the bird afloat. And the bird of humanity has been flying in circles for 500 years. And they say that in the 21st century, the female wing, the feminine in all of us will fully express itself. The male wing will then be able to relax in all of us. And for the first time in 500 years, the bird of humanity will soar. And I love that prophecy because it doesn't make anybody wrong, <laughs> men or women, we're all responsible. Um, and for me, this, I'm, I'm leading a women's circle at, on Humanity Rising on Friday with some of the greatest women in the world, Vandana Shiva, Jane Goodall, you know, extraordinary women. 
on Friday in Humanity Rising. And when I was preparing for this circle of women, I was talking to the convener, Jim Garrison, and he said he did an all-day meditation to prepare for this thing called Humanity Rising. And at the end of the day, he asked himself a question he wanted to wake up with, if he, could, if he were dictator of the world, he would do one thing that would change the world for the better after the pandemic. Uh, what would it be? And he woke up with, he would put women in charge of every single country in the world, every single company in the world, and every single institution. And, um, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the answer of a, of a, of a man. Um, uh, but I'm, it, it, it's not necessarily women, it's the feminine in, in, in you. Uh, that you are asking me these questions. It's the, it's the heart and love that had Chip uh, create the Modern Elders Academy. It's probably the, the, um, the balance that we're all finding at this time of life, you know, that is part of uh, being a modern elder. Uh, it is relaxing that masculine drive that is in overdrive and exercising that feminine um, a depth that that makes everything worth doing and this is not either or we need both but we need them in better balance so I think our um, patriarchy is pretty much over <laughs> uh, you know we can see it in the last throes of it in our current administration is like a curse of grotesque uh, expression of a dying culture uh, an overbearing controlling narcissistic part of who we are is it's not just that particular human being but all of us have that in us and that person is just showing us how ugly it is so that we 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 sort of cleanse it out of ourselves um in that way it's a kind of a a drama to like a a teaching play like a like a greek tragedy that we can learn from um, rather than attack because that's in everybody and then to know that the rise of the feminine in everybody, the rise, the emergence of women, the emergence of the feminine, the emergence of compassion, the emergence of the power of love um, is so uh, vital for this time. Um, and that that's maybe what's going on. Maybe that's really what's going on. That's the evolutionary leap we're in. I pray, I hope, I commit. <laughs> And my closing question, uh, my closing thought is, is you often mention this idea of money as a currency of love. So to build on your thought about this, you know, the power of love in this moment, how is money even potentially a currency of love? Well, uh, money, uh, you know, that's a, I could go on for about an hour on that, but money is, it, it, we invented it, look. It is not part of the natural world. Money does not grow on trees. Pennies do not rain from honey. We made it up. We made it up 4,500 years ago, and it became a society-wide uh, you know, icon. Uh, but we made it up originally to facilitate the sharing of goods and resources so everyone was taken care of in the village. That's why we made it up. Not to accumulate it, not to acquire it. You know, we. At that time, people were known for what they allocated, not what they accumulated. Um, and that's the way we want the world to be now. Be known for what you allocate, not what you accumulate. So money is, it doesn't belong to any of us. It belongs to all of us. It just keeps moving around. It's like water. That's why it's called a currency. It's a current. It's a carrier. It flows through every life. Um, and for some people, it's a rushing river. For other people, it's a little trickle. But our job is to receive it, let it nourish us, and pass it on where it'll do the most good for the most folks, not to hold on to it. Um, and that is almost hard for us to imagine in consumer culture. However, if we can understand that it's not about amount, it's about flow. It's about flow. That's feminine. Flow rather than measurement, rather than amount. Um, and we need to look at where money's coming from and where it's going, how it moves. It's a carrier. It, that's why we call it a currency. It flows through every life. And it carries greed or it carries love, commitment, courage, nourishment, service. It, money doesn't make people sick. What we add to money makes people sick. Just like water doesn't make people sick, but what we put in water makes people sick. Water's pure. When it's pure, it cleanses. 
It purifies, it makes things grow. Same thing with money, when it's pure. But when it's hoarded and held, it becomes toxic to those who are holding it, actually, just like water. Or like blood, you know, when blood clots, it kills. But if it's flowing, it carries disease and nourishment and everything through the body in a way that the body can manage itself. We need to understand that money's like that too. We invented it to be of service to each other. We invented it to make sure that everybody has what they need and want. That's its purpose. And then we have all these financial instruments that, that restrict it and hold it um, and, and pool it in places where it becomes toxic and corrupts. Um, yeah, and, and you know, I, I mean, I, I don't wanna go on and on too long, but if, if when you have more than you need, you're in overflow and overflow is designed to share with everyone else. That's what overflow is. Once you have more than you need, it's overflowing. That's a beautiful way to live. That's what Chip's doing. That's what this is. This is the overflowing power of Chip's productivity as a businessman. Um, and this is an example of being in the overflowing generosity of a human being who's clear about money, really clear about money. He's clear how to earn it and he's clear how to use it. So I feel like I'm in the flow of the generosity of, 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 of your founder. Um, and that is such a gift, uh, such a blessing. And with this blessing, I hope to bless uh, everybody who's on this call. <laughs> I, I think every single person on this call could just sit here and listen to you for another hour with, without interruption, but we're coming up to time. So I'd love to open up and see if anybody has questions or rather knowing that there are questions. Does anyone want to ask a question and we'll see how many of you we can get in. I'll look for hands. So just raise your hand and, um, and I'll call on you. Benny. Hi, I, I got a question. I, I, I actually read, I love the book, Soul of Money. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. I can. thank you. Yes, I love the book and I love the way how you de describe scarcity versus uh, uh, sufficiency. One of, my, one of the things that came to my mind is why do you choose the word sufficiency versus abundance? Because sometimes I think it's, it, it seems like abundance is the opposite of scarcity. I would like to love to hear it from you. Oh. you know, why you chose that word? That's an excellent, excellent question. Okay. <laughs> because I personally struggle with that. I'm trying to see the distinction. Well, let me, I love that you asked that question. It's very helpful for me to uh, clear, clear that up also. So um, I make a distinction between sufficiency and abundance. Mm -hmm. um, and um, abundance is not a bad thing, but in the mindset of scarcity, abundance is excess. It's landfills. It's waste. It's environmental de degradation. In the mindset of scarcity, if you can go back to that mindset of scarcity, there's not enough, more is better. That's just the way that it is, that over accumulation. But in the context, I, I call that the lie of scarcity, frankly, but in the context, Benny, of sufficiency, of enough, mm -hmm. that there's enough in this world for everyone everywhere to have a healthy and productive life, in that context, which is what I believe is true, mm -hmm. then, a True abundance comes from the overflowing recognition of enough. Right. So I'm going to tell you a story to answer this, and I know we're going to run out of, I'll try not try to do it fast. So I have a teacher named Brother David Stendelrost. He's, he has a website called gratefulness.org. He's 96 years old. He's the most amazing guy. I asked him, he's the living icon of something called gratefulness. And I asked him once, Brother David, he's a monk, what's the difference between What's the difference between gratitude and gratefulness? And he said the coolest thing. So this is really the answer to your question. He said, gratefulness is the experience of life when the bowl of life is so full mm -hmm. that it's almost overflowing, but not quite. Mm -hmm. The bowl of life is so full that it's bowed at the top, but not yet dribbling over the edges. Mm -hmm. And that's the blessed experience of the great fullness of life. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the great fullness of life, you're one with God, one with the universe, and there is no other. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're in the great fullness of life is so fulfilling that the bowl of life starts to overflow and you go into the other branch of gratitude, which is called Thanksgiving. And in this branch of gratitude, Thanksgiving, 
the bowl of life is overflowing like a fountain. And it's so nourishing for you that all you want to do, you discover suddenly, oh, there's an other. So all you want to do is give and serve and share and contribute. And that's so fulfilling that that puts you in the great fullness of life over here again. Um, and this is sufficiency. This is enough. And once you recognize that you have enough, it overflows into thanksgiving. And then this is true abundance. So the distinction I'm making is if, if you really are in touch with what you already have and you share it, it overflows into natural abundance. So abundance doesn't, I don't think you can get to true prosperity or true abundance through the window of more. That will only take you to lack. But through the window of enough and the deep appreciation and sharing of enough, that leads you right through the door to true abundance, the overflowing truth of the universe, which is bounty. Wow. Did Thank I you. answer your question? Thank you. Yes, appreciate that. Thank you. Good question. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm looking for hands. They're speechless. <laughs> I've, got yeah. one. I've got one. Can you hear me? Okay, Pat, yes, please. Yeah, yeah real, quick, real quick. When I left the MEA uh, a little over a month ago, I, I left with two mindsets that I was going to kill. One was I was going to dissolve my ego, and the other one was change my mindset about money and to break that mindset that my self worth and my net worth were not connected. Well, when I arrived back, the day I arrived back, I got a lot of help with that because the stock market crashed and I lost virtually all of my safety net. So now I'm really confronted. That little bugger doesn't die easily. I mean, it just keeps coming back that I am not enough. I should have more. So what's your advice on how to, how to keep driving that thing back? I think you've already answered that to, to a great extent, but at a practical level, when that thing creeps back into my mind, I should have more at this point in my life, and now I've practically got nothing, and I'm too old to start all over again. What do I do? Well, first of all, you don't have nothing. So make sure that you don't um, uh, speak in a way that uh, doesn't validate and affirm the life you actually do have, which is filled, I'm sure, with blessings and experience and relationships and this course and the you know, 800 people who've been through this program and the friendships um, and the people who love you. Um, because when it really comes down to it, that's what life's about anyway. And that's really what we take uh, from life. Um, and secondly, the, the, um, the humbling that comes with that kind of a, a hit. <laughs> yes, it's very really humbling. It's humbling. And um, it makes you really pay attention newly to what matters to you. And um, I really think that when you look, uh, I, I used to work with the Madoff survivors. Uh, at first, they called themselves the Madoff victims. There were 150 families that um, asked me to come and work with them after they lost everything through the Madoff thing. And they called themselves the Madoff victims. And um, the first thing we did was change the name to Madoff Survivors because they were still alive. They still loved each other. They still had families. They still, you know, they still were, they were okay. Um, and they began to actually see that there was a, uh, um, it was what they lost gave them a chance to see what they had never seen that it was time to find. So it was kind of a lost and found they found new ways of seeing prosperity, new ways of, I'll call it wealth being, which the source of the word wealth is well being. That's where that word comes from. And the well of your being, if I can put it that way, Pat, and I don't know you, but I love that background <laughs> you're in front of, is pretty deep, I bet the well of your being is probably infinite. And that's the source of your wealth, your well-being. Um, and if you can stay centered in that and then have the ebb and flow of the financial drama we're in, know that it's, that's not who you are, that's the drama we're in, we're all in it. 
but your well-being, the well of your being is absolutely intact, secure, safe, healthy, and infinitely abundant. Um, Do we have time for one more? Sorry. I don't think so, because we've got a little, we're going to close with some journaling, but if you write it, maybe we can have Lynn um, answer it. Then we were talking just before um, we came online on um, maybe some journaling we could set people up with, something that they might think about as, as they go out of this conversation. And, and you had us, um, you, you, were, you were thinking of having us talk about or, or write about um, dwelling in what we love, um, mm -hmm. the, the title of, of what you were proposing. Can you, can you sort of help us think into that as a possible journaling prompt for maybe as, we're, as we leave this conversation? Yeah, well, I would recommend that, uh, especially during this um, sheltering at home period, however long it lasts, that we develop, uh, that we notice what habits are starting to wane, habits that we didn't want, that we don't want, habits that are unconscious, and replace them with practices that are conscious. Because here's the deal, we're always practicing something. Some of it is unconscious and some of it is conscious and it creates little you know, pathways in the brain. So if we let go of habits that we don't want anymore and add practices that we do want and create kind of new pathways in the brain during this time when we're sheltering at home, it's an ideal time for that. And one of the things that I love to practice is dwelling in what I love. And when I say dwelling in what I love, actually acknowledging, celebrating, speaking about what I love. Just notice when you ask someone, um, you know, did you like that restaurant? And they come back, I love that restaurant. It creates a field. Not just, oh yeah, I liked it, it was really great. I, I love that restaurant. Or I love being at home. Or I love being on this call. Or I love the Modern Elder Academy. When you say you love something, actually those words, there's a, I don't know if this is scientifically true, but I think there's an energetic field that love creates, the words I love. And we're so measured and sort of cool and hip about what we say. And we sometimes don't really say what we love and say it with passion. So I recommend that you say what you love to the people around you or on Zoom if they're not there in your home, like 10 times a day. And then I have a practice with my grandchildren and my children that's so fun that we're doing during this pandemic. Every night we all write to all of, there's 12 of us, five gratitudes for the day before we go to bed. And um, today I was grateful for, I am grateful for, and you know, the kids, some of the kids are like, one is eight years old, the others, some are in college. They say, gosh, the sunshine or the tree outside my room, I never really noticed it's burst into spring. They're saying things that I, I'm learning about them. So I recommend you speak about, write about, dwell in what you love, uh, and do some sort of gratitude practice for the next week and see how that feels. I, I love talking to you. I know. <laughs> I love talking to you. <laughs> um, guys, let's unmute and say thank you, but that was just amazing. Thank you so much, Lynn. Oh,